right. Hello, welcome to episode number 238. Wow, Chris. <laughs> what does this button do? It's an educational show about smartphone and technology with us geeks on tour. Good deal. While we're here, remind you to click the bell, like us on Facebook, give us a thumbs up, and all those other things that you like to do. We have a quick tip. We always start a show with a quick tip. What happens to my Google account? Yeah, well, today's today's main topic, we have a guest presenter talking about digital estate planning. So my tip is just what happens to your Google account when you die. And it's a pre-recorded segment. Oops. Gold with Geeks on Tour. And in this tutorial video, I want to talk about what happens to your Google account when you die. Google calls that an inactive account because it could be for some reasons other than death. If you do nothing, there are certain actions Google will take, and there are some preparations that you can make ahead of time. Google refers to this as your inactive Google account because it could be for other reasons besides death. If you have not signed into your Google account for two years, it is considered inactive. All content can be deleted, the account may be deleted, the account username will be retired, meaning it cannot be used by anyone, including the original owner. You can plan now by setting up your inactive account manager. Let me show you how. Open a Chrome browser and make sure you're logged in with your account. Then you can click your account profile and manage your Google account. This is where all the settings for your account are. Notice it takes you to myaccount.google.com, so you can go straight there. We're talking about data and privacy. Lots of stuff here. The one we're dealing with today is all the way at the bottom. Make a plan for your digital legacy and you click start. Tell us how long we should wait before we make your account inactive. The pencil shows you that three months is the least amount of time. Before we take any action, we'll contact you multiple times by SMS. So you need to have a phone number if you want them to do that. They'll also send you email and maybe your recovery email as well. Click Next. Choose who to notify and what to share. You can choose up to 10 people. Click Add Person and you put in their email address. They will not get an email right now, only when your account becomes inactive. And you can specify what data they can download. They, so I'm going to say that this person is just going to get my blogger data. Next. Adding a phone number for the person is not required, so I am going to skip it. Click Save, and you can add another person and give them access to different parts of your account. Or you can give them access to everything. But realize this isn't access where they are actually getting into your account and using it. This is just access to download the data. Next, this is an important one. If you use Gmail, you can also set up an auto reply that will be sent after your account becomes inactive. You can write anything you want here as the subject and the message. You can specify to only send that auto reply to people who are in your contacts. And next. Lastly, you can decide if your inactive Google account should be deleted. You can say no, leave it act, leave it you can say leave the data there as long as possible. Once you hit the two year point, they still can delete it. Review plan, confirm plan. At any time you can come in here and turn it off or change the people who will be notified, etc. So that is the inactive Google account manager. But realize if you want somebody to be able to go in and use your Gmail or use your Google Photos, the only way to accomplish that is if they have your username, your password, and access to whatever device is needed for two-factor authentication. All right. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Jim, and here together with my wife, Chris, we're Geeks on Tour. Do you think your smartphone is smarter than you? And do you have questions about your iPhone or your Android tablet or phone? And how do you learn about these amazing devices? Well, we are geeks, also known as <laughs> Propellerhead. We are geeks who teach, and we think the best way to learn is in bite-sized pieces on a regular basis, which is why we came up with this show. We pick a different topic each time and go into a little bit of depth, and all of our content is then collected on our website at geeksontour.com. All right, Chris, where are we now? Well, we are home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Our guest speaker today is out in Southern California. Judy will be bringing her on in a minute. We are trying to keep cool and taking advantage of whatever pool is available this week. <laughs> uh, working out pretty good, though, isn't hope, it? Hope everybody else is, too. We do have a beautiful pool, so absolutely we like doing that. Want to say hi to some of our friends out there watching me, Judy, Bill, and Karen, Tom Parks. Let's see, probably a few more. Hi, everybody. Yeah, great to see you. Set this up. One of my daughters is the person that will be notified, and she knows that I've done this. Good job. Excellent. I'm not surprised, Bob. <laughs> okay. <laughs> New Mexico, Phoenix, Arizona. I hope you're keeping warm. And Joe. Is there a way to pin Google Photos on the taskbar? Okay, that's, that's, maybe, maybe we'll get that later. <laughs> okay. And Paulsbo, Washington, only 80 today. It's yeah, that's cool. Going right down <laughs> in Wisconsin. All right. We thank our premium members. You're the ones that make our work possible. If you want to become a premium member at Geeks on Tour, just go to geeksontour.com and click on join now. Our premium members, one of the benefits is the backstage pass. Right after this show, we have a Zoom meeting where we invite our premium members to come in. They can talk about the show. They can ask us any questions. And that's one of the wonderful benefits. You'll get an email link from Chris. And if you didn't get that, you can go to our website, geeksontour.com, and go to the member login page. You'll find it there. And our guest speaker today, Judy Tour, has agreed that she will be participating in our backstage pass with us. So any questions that you have that don't get answered during the presentation, if you're a member, We'll see you backstage. Okay. So our guest speaker today is Judy Talor. We know her from the Association of PC Users Groups. We've been involved with them for quite a few years. We know Judy as a proponent of lifelong learning. That, that makes her a, a compadre of ours and she is very active in APCUG. She's a 28-year member of her local computer club, and she taught adult education classes for technology for 21 years. We specifically know her by being part of the Speakers Bureau. So she has booked us to speak several times, so now we've booked her to speak. Hello, Judy. Hi there. <laughs> Okay. And so tell us, uh, you know, if you want to add anything to that introduction or specifically, what made you come up with this topic? I just thought it was a good idea when I put my uh, living will together, so to speak, living trust. Uh, yeah, I had umpteen gazillion pages of information that the attorney wanted. And there really wasn't anything about digital stuff. And I'm a digital person. And one of the uh, members of the Central Kentucky Computer Society uh, wrote an article about this and included a short uh, checklist of things that you should, you know, make your executor aware of. I got in touch and said, do you mind if I use that? Because I'd already put a presentation together and a small list. And he said, go for it. So the presentation has been uh, down to the Greater South Bay Users Group. He, their president's a doctor. He added stuff 
the Westchester PC group in New York added things. So, and we've just meshed it all together. And it's a fun presentation to give. I call it my living presentation about death because oftentimes people say, hmm, why did not you include this? You know, fill in the line. So I quickly research it and add it to the presentation. So it is changing all the time. We understand. And I'm just so glad you're doing this. I had been thinking about doing it because obviously it is an important topic. Mm -hmm. And so when I learned that you already had the presentation, why reinvent the wheel? Now, people, if you have questions, I'm going to just turn the stage over to Judy completely because I know she has a lot of great information to cover. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and Jim or I will be monitoring the chat. If we can answer them in the chat, we will. Otherwise, if there's some time left at the end, we'll bring up your questions at the end. Okay. With that, I let Judy take over. Thank you. This is really a silly question, but how much of your life is virtual? And you're going to go, well, all of it. And do you know anyone who doesn't have a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, or a wearable, anything that is digital? We all have friends and relatives that are like that, and it's nice to pass this kind of information on to them because every email payment movie you name it and file in the cloud is considered ours there are digital assets and what happens if we die and no one can retrieve them well your estate can get stuck in digital probate uh, my dentist right now each time i go in every three months are you still working on your mom's estate it's been almost two years and it's just been an absolute mess. We don't want that to happen when we're no longer here. So they're broadly defined as info about us that is electronic, posted online, stored in any kind of device, no matter what it is. And that includes, of course, the cloud. The year after we are no longer here is one of the most vulnerable times for ID theft. And you think about it, I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time making my security is up to date and all that good kind of stuff, different passwords for everything. I do not want my ID stolen now, let alone when I'm no longer here. Well, death is a public record and the bad guys have absolutely nothing to do but sit at home in their bathrobes and fuzzy slippers and look at all kinds of online records where they get a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then all of a sudden, they're us. And most people, my attorney included back in 2009, didn't think about a digital footprint. It is a brand new thing that's going on in the world. So managing it after our death while we're still here protects our privacy, our identity, and our reputation. And our heirs don't need to get caught in a long, drawn-out probate process that is still being legally defined. Um, the same thing as now. But we're no longer here, but they take over our accounts. There's taxpayer ID theft and refund, medical ID theft that's huge, driver's license. They apply for new credit cards and loans. I have to laugh at this. They apply for employment. Not in my time. And um, they take over our accounts, et cetera. And it's called ghosting. Problems with our estate. Creditors come after our heirs. We certainly don't want that to happen. Lenders being fooled. And some of our hard-earned money can be lost. So we need to make sure we don't include too much identifying information when we write our obits. I read in the paper all the time, and oh my gosh, there's so much information, and it would be easy to steal that person's ID. And that's why I say we're the techie people. We're security oriented. We know the type of information that we like would like to put out there. My son is no longer with us, and his sisters and I wrote his uh, memorial page. And I looked it up the other day and I thought there is not one darn thing on that page that could 
lead anybody in any way, shape, or form to steal his ID. I pat ourselves on the back for doing an excellent job. Those kinds of things are published in newspapers and online. Anybody in the world can access it. They stay on the funeral tribute page, it seems, forever. It can be on a memorial page somewhere. Make sure you don't include too much information. I could see that if I didn't write mine, my daughters would go, oh, you know, oh, well, we'll add this. Okay. You know, we'll just put this in about mom. And mom is looking over their shoulder going, I don't think so. So I got in touch with my local newspaper and said, when somebody asks you for open information, what do you, what do you send them? So they sent me their form. This was part of it. This is fine. Uh, I don't think they need to know where I was born or the date that I was born. They can put, okay, how old I was when I'm no longer here. Uh, I do not want my parents' names out there. I don't want graduation years for anything. We have had our 60th reunion, and there is no telling what is on the high school website when they put information about me. So I'm not putting the graduation year in either high school or college. Um, do we really need that? Oh my gosh, that person's been married five times and their marriage dates, totally unnecessary. In my case, I also doesn't, don't think it's necessary that uh, they say, oh, she worked in the HR department and the legal department. And, but I've been a volunteer for years. And that, that, that's more pertinent with that. Awards, accomplishments, memberships, again, don't put the dates. Who knows, you belong to the XYZ organization. There's no telling what kind of information is on that page that you may or may not know about. So don't put the dates and make it easy for them to look for. The rest of the things, you know, that's fine. And again, boy, if they've got your mother's maiden name, golden address, when everybody comes home after the services and whatever happens afterwards, they might walk in the house and look around and go, huh, everything's gone. Uh, use your age, name of school, pets names. We all say, don't ever include your pet's name in you know, your password. Well, we know people don't pay attention. So if they get your pet's name and two or three other things, they have a place to where they can start messing around with trying to figure out what your password is. So from AARP, as little as $10 with your name, address, and birth date, the bad guys can purchase your social security number on the internet. I would think, I would hope it was worth more than that, but I've even found a couple of websites where you can just get it for free with just your name. So I personally don't want a thief to come me and rack up charges, open new accounts, and trash my identity. As I said, I have worked uh, almost 35 years working with technology not to have that happen. So our Facebook page, email accounts, they're going to outlive us. So managing our digital legacy may be the trickiest part of our estate planning. We want to make it as easy as we possibly can for those who are taking care of that after we're no longer here. Uh, we don't plan. That's a possibility. All those family photos you have up in the cloud, nobody will be able to get to. Setting, settling our final bills, make more difficult for them. We need to make it as easy as we possibly can. And of course, each online service provider has its very own terms of service, just like for us in the software world. And they say you handle your ending your accounts this way. The next one says, oh, no, no, we do it this other way. And every state has different laws. The feds have different laws. So we want to make sure that our digital executor doesn't violate any terms of service stored under the Stored Communications Act. And again, this is all in its infancy. They're there, though, to protect our digital assets from unauthorized assets to to protect us against fraud and ID theft. And we go, that's good. We don't want that to happen. Uh, the laws are rapidly changing. 
Uh, essentially, your estate plan gives your digital executor authorization to access any necessary digital data. My executor happens to be a dual person. I have given this presentation many times over the years, and every once in a while, someone will say, oh my gosh, I never thought about any of my digital stuff. My executor knows absolutely nothing about computers. And of course, the laws aren't standard. The Uniform Law Commission is helping to standardize those laws. They're drafting model legislation. Now, if you are somebody who lives in two states, you need to make sure that you have gotten the rules and regulations for both states. They are not going to be the same. And of course, if they even come up with model legislation, I live in California and we kind of tend to do our own thing. So I think the first thing we need to start with is a list. We have a ton and a half accounts up there and just sitting down, could we make an accurate list of all of them? And here's a bullet point list. You have some of these, all of these. Many of you have a lot more of these that you're gonna have to think of taking care of. You don't want your executor to be worried about it and going, tearing their hair out, which is just a nice way to put it. So what do you need logins and passwords for? Almost everything, your smartphone, your wrist tech, your tablets, your computers, possibly your external drives, your Wi-Fi, your network and modem, your router, any entertainment, Netflix, whatever, accounts you use to purchase anything. With me, it's Amazon Prime. Do you shop online? They're all going to have logins and passwords. Online banking, other financial services. You pay your bills online, money manage, management tax programs. Software or subscriptions you pay for monthly or annually. And I thought, you know, I just really don't have that many of them. <laughs> and then you start getting the email that says, you know, it's going to drop, you know, within uh, three, three weeks. If you no longer want this subscription, let us know. And I thought, OK, yeah, get real, Judy, add those to your list. And of course, all of our social media accounts. I have one. That's Facebook. It's easy for me. Many people are all out and about on social media. And hopefully they have different logins and passwords for each one. And if you have something monetary online, who gets the assets? Do you have a podcast? Do you have a YouTube channel where you're making money? A website or e-commerce commerce stores? That has to be passed on with all the security information that goes along with that. So create a list of your online accounts. And then your next question is, do you really need all of them? How many email accounts do you have that you have not used in years? I thought, okay, Judy, what can you do? Well, in class, I never had my own Yahoo account, but I needed to have a Yahoo account so I could do screenshots for my students. Well, I closed my Yahoo account, patted myself on the back and said, oh, what a good mother you are. So please take a look at your accounts, whether they're shopping accounts, email accounts, whatever. And the more things that you can close, it's going to be the less for your digital executor to do. And if they're the kind that cry at the drop of a hat because you're no longer there, it's going to save them some tears. Uh, again, do you have accounts that are paid automatically? Don't forget to add them to your list. Photos, photo albums in the cloud. Of course you need to add them to your list. Uh, do you have a lot of photos that no one will know who they are after you're gone? I have a black trunk sitting on my hearth to my left, and it came over from Pennsylvania to El Segundo, California, when my dad's dad uh, helped put the refinery together in El Segundo, the Standard Oil refinery. It was filled with photos of old people. I have absolutely no idea who they are. My aunt possibly would. Well, she hasn't been around for a thousand years. So one day I shredded them. And again, I patted myself on the back and said, okay, 
when the kids open up that trunk, they're not going to go, oh, for heaven's sakes, mother, why didn't you take care of this? If they're pictures of people you know, scan them, add identifying information, or like I did, destroy them. Again, save your heirs time and tears. Uh, this is something I learned at the Sarasota, Florida presentation. Have you designated beneficiary for your DNA, DNA test results? I don't do genealogy, and I didn't even think about that. Well, the results are going to remain in the database after we're gone. And the gentleman said, you need to add that to your list, Judy. Who's going to be able to control them, or do you want them destroyed? Your choice. So it was added. So one of the things you do, need to do, and I did this after the fact, of course, is add a digital executor in your will or living trust. If you have, you know, if closing all of that counts really makes it much too much for your regular executor to do. Uh, they need to be familiar with all things digital, email accounts, social media accounts, <clears throat> different kinds of online storage computers, laptops, tablets, phones, different operating systems. If you don't all have the same thing, they need to know about popular apps and software. Um, and please don't include any of your logins and passwords in a will because it's a public document. So make it easier for your digital executor, research how to close the accounts. We're the techie people. We know how to go on uh, the browser of our choice or the search engine of our choice and search with how to close X, Y, Z and either create a list of the URLs so they can quickly click on it to see how to close it, download the instructions, whatever you think your digital executor would like you to do or, you know, to make it easier again for them. So what do you use? for all of the account information, logins, passwords, for every single thing you need closed. <clears throat> Do you use a password program? Do you have your list on an encrypted flash drive? Is it on an encrypted file on your computer? Do you have it in a notebook? Please, if you have it in a notebook, make sure that someone is able to read your handwriting. Uh, I print. I, my handwriting is atrocious after all of the years of being in preschoolers and kindergartners and all that good kind of stuff. And my printing is much better. But if I were to write my logins and passwords, I guarantee you that there would be no one in my family that would be able to read them. So please make sure that your notebook is readable and that it's up to date. If you have uh, changed a certain password two or three times, <clears throat> Make sure that you've crossed off completely the ones that are no longer any good. So there is absolutely no chance of somebody trying password number one. Ooh, that didn't work. Password number two, hmm, that didn't work. Password number three, better be good or I'm locked out of the account. So here's an old fashioned flash drive. And back in the day, one of APCUG's groups sent an email out to their uh, list and I'm on many other groups lists across the country and they said we um, have some of our internet address and password logbooks left if you would like one um, we'll be more than happy to mail it to you and I personally thought that was a strange thing for a group to be giving out because are were we supposed to put a great big white label across that so nobody could see what it is or put everything in there and then hide it someplace and go find it every time we needed to use it. That would have been my method of keeping things, but to each his own. And with many of the password managers, and that's really now, just like Chris talked about your Google account, uh, Gmail account, you can give somebody access to your passwords in the event you're unavailable. Again, you can specify a waiting period or grant them immediate access. One of my members who was on the younger side moved back to the Chicago area. And after two or three years, he got this mysterious thing and he was in, in a coma. And his wife was not privy to any 
of his information in the password program and things needed to be done. And she had absolutely no way to do it. Her daughter, uh, his boyfriend was an IT guy and he got in touch with LastPass, told him the story, got an affidavit from the hospital and they let her into the account, you know, one time only access, so to speak. So we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that if we are using a password manager account, we have it right in there, just like your Gmail accounts, how long and who has access to it. Dashlane is one of the more popular programs. One password says, hi, we have never been hacked. And again, uh, LastPass has said they've been hacked several times, but if you have an absolutely fantastic password, we really don't care if they get hacked because we have this great convoluted password that it's gonna take them 2 billion years to figure out. And then Bitwarden is kind of the new open kit on the block, the open source one. Uh, many people move from LastPass to Bitwarden seamlessly. Do you have 2FA on your accounts? Great, you gotta have that information in your list. Uh, list of the accounts, the backup codes. If you don't know what where to find things, they're generally in the same area where you set it up. So you need to check out the setup menu. Do you need a fingerprint to access your phone, your laptop, whatever? You need to figure out another way for that to happen. Our standard joke was with my pixel, you needed my index finger. And I said, okay, Stace, just go down wherever I am and plop it on there. And of course it would be cold and it wouldn't work. So I went to a code instead. So we, the big thing, another big thing is we need to remember to keep all our account information up to date, wherever we are saving it. With the password manager program, it's Cinchy, but if you have a spreadsheet on a flash drive or your computer or in a notebook, you need to make sure that when you change a password, it is recorded in that. And if you are one who passes that, you know, spreadsheet information on to your executor, uh, you need to make sure you keep them up to date with the latest information. I have one email account where all my verifications go. If I have to change a password or I have forgotten a password, the account that I have had since 2003 gets everything. So that is, you know, Stace knows. That's the very last thing that you ever close and you leave it open for quite a while, just in case. So many websites are out there that put lists together. Uh, I came across Everplans. I really like it. It's got a ton and a half of information. It's got a a ton and a half, again, of free resources for you. Of course, they would like to be your be all end all and help you for a fee, put your information together, uh, but your choice, but you can use the information for the resources and that give you a heads up on a lot of the closing account information, links to what is specific in your state where you live on where to find whatever. And they say, we store and share everything important. And Everplan is a secure digital archive of everything your loved ones will need should something happen to you. And again, uh, it's like the ID theft presentation I give. Uh, we're capable of doing all of that ourselves instead of paying somebody to do it for us. So these are the kinds of things they have important information about your accounts and passwords, by golly. Health and medical information. If you haven't done a DNR and you don't know what to say and you're doing it yourself as much as you possibly can to cut down on the cost, you'll find that type of information at Everplants. The one thing that everybody needs to do if they haven't, even at what may or may not be this late date since many of us are seniors, is a social security account. The reason that you need one of those is uh, you don't want the bad actor to find out enough information that they can open 
a social security account in your name. Whether you use it or not, I really don't care, but you need, everybody needs this. If you've your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, if you have them and they have social security numbers, everybody needs an account just to keep the bad actors away. You also need an IRS account. Again, you know, access it or not, you need to have one so the bad actors don't set one up for you. I gave this presentation many years ago to the Glendora Seniors uh, Computer Club about an hour east of me. And during Q&A, this guy raised his hand and he, and I can't remember if it was the Social Security or the IRS. And he said, I wholly agree with what she said about opening an account. He said, when I went to open up account, lo and behold, I already had one. And of course he didn't. He said, I have gone down to the office with my birth certificate, identifying information, saying, hi, this is really me. Honest, it's me. I'm standing right here. He said, I have been working on it over a year, trying to get them to close whoever set up the account in the first place and let him open his own account. So make sure that doesn't happen to you. In APCUG, these are the kinds of things I get. One of the things you need to know, remember is other organizations you belong to and who should be notified that you need to be taken off the email list or whatever. But I got this in January 5, 2021, and I got it from a state. I usually get it from a, a son or daughter letting me know that mom or dad is no longer with us. Please note, Charles was deceased in September 2020. Please remove him from future emails. I thought, way cool. And as it happened, I knew exactly what email he had received. And it had taken them until January to let me know. So he'd also received several others. Uh, the uh, club that belongs to APCUG didn't let me know. But his estate did. And like I said, I often hear from the kids who are monitoring uh, mom or dad's email accounts. So be proactive and make sure this doesn't happen. If you have a Yahoo account and you don't have a login, you need to, the, your executors will need to send a letter. How many people have sent letters to anybody lately uh, with your um, request stating the Yahoo ID of the deceased? a copy of several documents, a copy of your death certificate, or simply log in with the password, go to the user deletion page and boom, you're done. Much easier if again, you have done some research and you have got a link to this page and they know what your Yahoo username and password are. Gmail and Gmail, uh, there's a 12-step form that that person will need to complete. Plus, scan all kinds of documents and attach them, and so on and so on. How much easier would it be to do what Chris talked about at the beginning of the meeting? Seriously, which one is easier? Which one is going to make your executor a more happy camper? So I personally have two unique Gmail accounts. I have one Tech Club account. I have more than six APCUG Gmail accounts. Well, I only need to worry about three of them. Uh, uh, Stace is going to be sending an email to APCUG's president and say, mom's offline. You might want to you know, do something with all the Gmail accounts. And so again, you need to think what organizations need to be notified that you're no longer here. Your Facebook account, do you want it memorialized or closed? You need to decide that. Now, um, I get uh, from Facebook every Jan January, uh, please wish Sal uh, Sandy, last name, a happy birthday. Well, Rand's been gone for 11 years and Sandy's been gone for 11 years. And every January I am asked to wish her 
my son's best friend's mother a happy birthday. They don't know anything about Facebook. They don't know how to do this. Twitter, you deactivate it. Instagram, those are the steps. Provide you're an immediate member. Uh, they want a copy of your death certificate, proof of authority that you're really the person that can do this. And how much easier it is for all of these if your executor has your password and your login credentials. Facebook, verification you're an immediate family member, copy of the death certificate, or I don't understand this, birth certificate, the power of attorney that says that you can do this, a copy of the will, living trust, or estate letter, plus a copy of the obit or memorial card. Or, and once you have that done, you send in a request, you fill out another form and full name, URL. Well, those things are easy. And if you have the login and password, you just go into the delete my account page and you can, if the person who has the account has not set it up in advance, if you have the username and password, it's super simple to do it. If you don't, you have the previous rigmarole to go through. Be kind to your executors. I recently attended a workshop put on by a, an attorney in the Santa Clarita Valley that uh, specializes in what we're talking about. And she said, we all need to create a spreadsheet or table, whichever one we use. That was my use. She said spreadsheet. I like tables of every liability we have, and we need to update it a minimum of once a year. Uh, the, uh, our financial obligations just don't go away because we're no longer here. Unpaid debts are covered by our estate, and it's the total assets owned at death. Owed. Executor administrator is responsible for paying any debts from the estate. They must be settled before heirs receive any money. And if there's stuff out there floating around that they don't know about, it's going to make the process longer. If you don't take the time to put a will or living trust together, the judge is going to decide how the assets should be distributed. And they'll appoint an administrator to carry out those decisions. And whoever was, you know, in your family was going to say, you know, I really wish mom or dad had taken the time to put a will or living trust together. If you co-signed for a loan, your state is responsible. Are you a joint account holder on a credit card? Your estate still responsible for any balances on the card. So I thought that she had some really good information in that workshop. Um, how much do you owe? Estate filed for probate. Creditors need to file claims. Assets transferred into a living trust will not require probate. States have a minimum, and of course, all the states are different, period, for creditors to present a claim or let the estate know they are owed money. And if someone lets the estate know they're owed money, how do we know that's really a true bill? You know, we might not as the executor. Um, criminals will contact grieving relatives from the information in the obit. They need to be aware of scam calls after it's been published. It's easy for the bad guys to call about money owed, money due, et cetera. That's why you need to have a minimal amount of information in your obit. Not, you know, contact information, everybody's maiden name twice removed, um, where they are in the line of siblings, where they live, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the... Rest of this presentation is kind of some tips for our, our executors. I have, you know, had several people tell me how difficult it has been for them. They didn't know how to respond. They didn't have this kind of information. So from an executor point of view, how to handle scam calls, demands for payment, and who to immediately contact. And then what happens if ID theft occurs? How many police departments do you need to get in touch with? How it needs to be reconciled? Recently, a friend said, um, a very good friend of hers, didn't know of, that she should contact the credit companies and somebody stole uh, their mom's ID. 
and she hadn't even thought about getting in touch with them. So when people are grieving, they don't necessarily um, think of everything. So the more information we can give them on handle how to handle our stuff, the better off they are and the better off we are. What comes along with this is a handout is a Word PDF of the presentation since it is easier to uh, read than a PowerPoint, a list of what I call walking in the front door, hands on hips, looking around and saying, where in the world has mother put this, that, or the other thing? Do you have a safe deposit box? How do you access it? Which bank? Uh, do you have a safe key combo lock? You know, what you're gonna do with your pets on and on and on. And uh, that's what's been added to over time. And I look at that as a list that I, the first small one I saw from Central Kentucky, uh, it didn't apply to, it applied to somebody who had a heck of a lot more money than I did. And so I added just the regular stuff and uh, it, one would go through it and cross off what is applicable, add what is, and then there's a uh, corresponding word table or Excel spreadsheet. And that, is your checkbox where you can say, okay, you know, the safe deposit box is at the XYZ bank, and this is how you get it. This is the person you talk to. Uh, or if you don't have one, you cross that off. And I am finished. Hey, wow. Now, I know that all of the viewers right now are feeling a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> that was a ton of information. And thank you so much for putting that together. I want to just, just what I think is the number one takeaway is just to get us thinking about it. You know, it's, it's something that we don't like to think about. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, you need to think about it. You need to be kind to your executor. Since I watched the recording of one of your past presentations on this, I've been thinking about it a lot. And I did, I think also probably two of the most important things I think you said was to set up a social security account and an IRS account. Not that you need one, but that you need to have it already set up so that some scammer doesn't try to set it up after you're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... And this is like, you, 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 you include things like this in your presentations. It hasn't happened to you. Like, I've never gotten a virus, but one of my students said they have it. I'd go, oh, gee, I'm really sorry to hear that. But I'd go, yes, I know they really are out there. Um, the gentleman at Glendora, he's had his stolen and a, an account set up. So it does happen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's absolutely one of the most prevalent ways of identity theft is mm -hmm. through Social Security, you know, or IRS. Uh, one thing that you mentioned that I, I hadn't heard before, didn't catch in the last time I, I listened to you, was about that there are laws that a digital executor might violate unknowingly. I hadn't, I hadn't. And I wonder if hmm, the simplest thing for an executor to do is to just log into my account when I'm gone with my credentials. So being me, do you know if that violates any? Mm -hmm. no. It's okay. like uh, I checked with my banks, Stace is on my account. And at other banks, larger banks, I'm with a, a small credit union. I said, is she going to have a problem getting all my money? And they said, absolutely not. At larger banks, that's a problem. It, at the minute that they find out you're dead, they lock your account. And I wanted to make sure that she had access to my money. So that, again, is something you need to check out with whoever you bank with. But again, those laws that I talked about, they're kind of always changing because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yet because it's brand new right? In, in the digital world, this kind of stuff. And as I mentioned in the chat, there is a whole new legal specialty 
called DAM, Digital Asset Management. And so not all, you know, if somebody has been a lawyer for a long time, they may not have that in their in their wheelhouse. So great, great information. And a lot of people were asking about uh, your your handouts. Now you said you would you would provide us with the handout so we can yes. we can email it out to everybody on our email list, mm -hmm. which which means our newsletter subscribers. Were there any other? I'm just going through it real quick here. Lowe's mostly and that looks like that lift. It is possible to download the presentation. We just talked about that. And of course, this is this is YouTube. This live presentation, as soon as we're done, is a recorded presentation at the same address. Just youtube.com geeks on tour and it's it's there. And John says I actually introduced the idea of digital legacy to my attorney about five years ago and worked with him to get all the ducks in a row. Good of job. Of course you did, Jolyn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. Another really interesting point, your executor, you know, what you put who you put as your executor on your will may not have a clue about technology. I mean, I want my digital executor to have access to my LastPass account. And the people that I had in mind, they they have to have a LastPass account themselves and be able to use it. And that's not everybody. <laughs> so I, I wrote up on a piece of paper and put it in a logical place in the house to say where things are. Is there an app or a method to scan the internet to identify where you have accounts online? Good question. Do you know? No, I don't think so. I mean, you can Google yourself yeah, and, and you'll find a bunch of stuff, but not everything. Yeah. Make sure to dress as digital. Digital executor is the person you identify in your estate plan. Only if your attorney is aware of that or you make them aware of that. Yeah. My attorney wasn't aware of it. And he asked me for all of my handouts to add to his to send out to his prospective clients. And I said, no problem. But my choice was history teacher, school board member, or business person. <laughs> uh, computer, she said, responsible for one of the the local university's employee database, that was no choice. As my son would say, Lori would be sitting there grading papers thinking, there's something I need to do for mom, and Stacy will just sit down and do this. Okay. Because that's what she does. She's into, And not that Lori doesn't know all about technology, it's just that her focus is not technology. How about the libraries and the different Audible and Kindle? I did read Audible and Kindle are both part of Amazon, right? So that would be your Amazon account. Yeah. Those are your online accounts. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, Peggy, it is. It is mind boggling. <laughs> cool. Judy, I alluded to some of this when she did her 2021 escapade presentation. Do you have a plan? We saw that. Yeah, I remember that. Was, that. that was an excellent presentation. So, yeah. Key is to save our executor time, <laughs> which translates into money for us. <laughs> oh gosh, are you supposed to pay your executor? Hmm. <laughs> uh oh, oops. They're earning it, that's for sure. <laughs> I imagine percent of people preparing for this digital is less than five percent. What mm. do you think? Yeah, Scroll this is being Walensky's. Uh, all right. Bob says. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. I'm still going. Wow. Yeah, I got a lot. Well, we will continue this conversation in our backstage pass. And uh, so let's. I don't are we see ready to wrap it up. You're looking for. OK, yeah, I guess okay. we are. Let's say goodbye to Judy for now. She'll hang on and we will have some. Yes, you're going to join us in the backstage pass. Did right, you get Judy? the link? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. Yeah, I, I emailed it. Excellent. To you. 
Well, again, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure having you on. And good stuff. Ex- really good excellent stuff. stuff. Okay. Where is my slideshow? There it is. Backstage pass for the premium members. Want to remind you, it's a Zoom meeting. You should have gotten the link in an email that Chris sent out earlier. Or it is on our website. And I checked and make sure made sure it worked this time. <laughs> and it did work for both of us. I as checked opposed too. to sometimes in the past. <laughs> don't no. No. Never no, apologize. Don't, don't apologize. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, we do have a couple of points here that we want to bring out. Uh, did you learn something? Can you identify your important digital assets? So these are just, you know. In, in looking back at this presentation, we hope that you come away with understanding that you need to identify your important digital assets. And do you know who to designate as your digital executor? It could be somebody different from, your, from the executor of your will. And do you have a plan for giving access to your data after you die? Because you can't do it after you're dead. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, the backstage pass is there. Please sign up for our newsletter. You need to do that right now to get the good information that Chris puts out on a regular basis. And and after you know, sometime next week, we will email out uh, the written presentation from from Judy. Thank yeah. you for offering that, Judy. Yes, and become a premium member at Geeks on Tour. Subscribe to the channels, like us on Facebook. Chris, what's the web page that lists all of our YouTube shows? geeksontour.com and the menu item is YouTube shows. And all of them are listed there. They are. <laughs> <laughs> What's the web page that lists all of our recent newsletters? geeksontour.com. The menu item is blogs and news. You'll see newsle- monthly newsletters for 14 years on there. And why do people pay $58 a year to do all of that stuff? They get, there's member benefits. You get to ask us questions in the member Q&A. There's the Zoom meetings that are private for members and hundreds of videos, all of our eBooks, and to get the written notes from these shows. Oh, that's going to be a chore for this. Oh, no, it'll be her handout. Yay. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> and some people sign up and pay us to be members just to say thank you for all the stuff we do for free. And we thank you. Very much so. So do become a member. It's about $58 if you go with the yearly plan. Geeksontour.com slash join now. Bop, bop. We already talked about that. That's it for us today. I'm Jim. I'm Chris. And we'll see you next time on What Does This Button Do? We'll be in the backstage pass in just a few minutes.